have to engage and understand. He's very familiar, but he's also a complex individual. And if you would, turn with me to Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. Exodus 4, 10 through 14. If, and if I go to Exodus, who do you think I'm talking about? Amen. Come on. Come on. We got some Bible people here. Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. I encourage you to follow your elder who's standing. I'm serious, man. We got to get to the point where we honor what leaders do. Amen. We're going to have a, another meeting coming up. But if you don't see a leader do it, don't you do it. But if you see a leader do it, you do it. If, and understand your level of authority as well. Uh, but when you see leadership do something, follow leadership. Amen. Come on, somebody. Matter of fact, I'm giving away what we're going to talk about next month. But anyway, <laughs> Exodus 4, 10 through 14. It says, Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to me. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with you and your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. But he said, O oh my Lord, please sin by the hand of whoever else you may see. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When, you, when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Let me set this up for you. Moses has just been recruited to be God's spokesperson for Israel's release from Egypt. Yet he lacks confidence in his ability to speak. And God is trying to convince him that he doesn't need to offer any excuses because I'm going with you. I'll show you what to say. I want to take my thought from verse 11 where it says, God rebuttaled Moses and his pity by saying, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Now, therefore, come, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. I'm from Generation X, and I do apologize, Generation C, Gen Z, but there was a point in our life. And Gen X, probably even before that, you probably got it from the baby boomers. Where if a person asks you to repeat yourself, to let them know that you meant business by what you said, you will look back at them and say, Did I stutter? For a few short moments, I want to speak from the subject of, Did I stutter? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the expression of what you want to do today. Bring clarity, bring understanding, bring wisdom, bring grace, and do your job. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 No, it's not politically correct. Folk will get upset if you 
say that to somebody today, but that's what they used to say. You want me to repeat myself? Or you, I'm going to let you know I mean baby. Then I stop. And then you better do it. Amen. Amen. We're living in a time where personal affirmation is of utmost importance to anyone who believes that they have something to do and accomplish in life. I think too often we don't do what we should do because we don't feel affirmed enough to do it. And I told y'all last week that sometimes the only good thing you're going to hear about yourself is what you say about yourself. And there was a time in my life where I didn't like my life. I didn't like who was in it. I didn't like my career. I didn't like nothing happening around me. I didn't like my money. I didn't like much at all about my situation. And I was a decade years old. You know, people say that now. I was today years old before I found out about something. I was a decade years old, or at that time, today years old, when I found out what affirmation meant. You have to understand that I grew up in a traditional church environment, and anything that's recited in those environments, other than the Bible, is looked at as ungodly. It was looked at as new age. It was looked at as the law of attraction. It was looked at as something that you do uh, if you're in the secular world trying to accomplish something. They told us that all we needed was the word of God. And I believe in the word of God. And, and I understand the word of God. But, but there are some things you got to understand that we think belong to the world, but in reality, they belong to God. They are in his Bible. David many times spoke to himself and recited to himself what it is that he believed God for, what, what he was standing on, what he was expecting from God. He would oftentimes recite it to himself and say it over and over and over again repetitiously in order to get the result that he wanted and in order to understand what it is that he needed to do. And there was a point in Moses' life where he had to do that as well. And we're, we're going to talk about that. Maybe if the Lord will tap me on my shoulder and remind me, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But I had to learn how to be affirmed in myself. I had to learn how to say things to myself like, I, I am successful. Oh my God, I am success. Successful and ambitious people are joining me in my efforts and endeavors every day. I just have to say stuff in my car because I didn't really want to go into that workplace and deal with those people and talk to them back and forth and deal with them that day. I would sit in my car and say, I am healthy. Oh my God, I do things and make decisions that make myself healthy every day. Oh my God, I am more than enough. My bank account is more than enough. My family is more than enough. My friends are more than enough. Oh, my environment is more than enough. My worship is more than enough. My praise is more than enough. My understanding of the Bible is more than enough. I had to learn how to recite things to myself. Hallelujah. I was looking on Instagram the other day. A video came up of Rick Ross. <laughs> And Rick Ross is widely successful. Yet Rick Ross was saying affirmations to himself. Rick Ross was saying, oh my God, he, he said things like, my success is superb, sustained, and substantial. <laughs> he kept reciting that to himself. My success is superb, sustained, and uh, uh, substantial. I wish I was recite that with me. Let's say it together. My success is superb, sustained, and substantial. Say it again. My success is superb, sustained, and substantial. Y'all don't believe it? I'm going to say it to myself. My success is superb, sustained, and substantial. I'm here to tell you that sometimes when you recite things over yourself, you can't just sit there and say it cool, calm, and collective. Cindy Trim, Dr. Cindy Trim teaches that when you pray certain things or say certain things, you got to put your body 
into it. You got to get your hands into it. You got to put your feet into it. You got to clap it out. You got to stomp it out. You got to bend. You got to bow. You got to sit. You got to do a little something like this. But whatever you got to do to get some stuff broken off of you, you got to learn how to say what God says about you and put your body into it. Put your back into it. Twerk it out if you got to twerk it out. Command 
hallelujah. Lord, yes, you have a command over your voice. You have a command over your words. You have a command over your expectation. People will start saying, yeah, uh, yeah, that dude talking some truth. You can be saying some silly stuff. And because you got a command, So I'm here to tell you the reason why you need to get a command over your voice is because you got to understand that when you walk into that board room, you got to be believable. When you go on that job interview, you got to be believable. When you stand up and submit that application for that loan, you got to be believable. Oh, yes. When you get that presentation, you got to be believable. You got to know that you know that I know what I'm talking about. Even if don't nobody else believe me, I believe me. Why do I believe me so much? Because I believe God. And I don't believe God would have wasted his time, molding, shaping, developing, lifting, and encouraging me if he didn't believe in me. And expect me to believe in myself. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, if don't nobody else believe in you, you better believe in you. You better not get caught dead down in yourself. God created you with a purpose. He developed you with a mind. He developed you with a heart. He developed you with a will. He developed you with purpose. How dare you doubt yourself? You got to learn that I'm going to say of the Lord. And you 
use his own words against them. Y'all got to catch this. Use his own words against them and belittle them by saying, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you kill that Egyptian? Oh, Lord, I didn't think nobody saw me smoking that blood. I didn't think nobody saw me going into the little store. I didn't think nobody saw me. Oh, my God. Ooh, look at that this and look at that that. Oh, they saw me. Surely this thing has been made known. Moses felt exposed. He felt belittled because the thing that he thought he did in private, the thing that he thought he had hidden, the thing that he thought he had buried, the thing that he thought he left behind had been brought up to the surface of his life. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that some of us are in situations we're in where we can't be used by God because we think the stuff that folk don't know about us is the only way we can do what God told us to do. But you got to learn how to do it whether they saw you do it. You got to learn how to do it whether they knew you did it. You got to learn how to do it whether they called you out of it. You got to learn how to do it in your own Moses. Moses was willing to serve God <laughs> or at least willing to do good as long as he thought what he did was not known. Oh my God, help me up in here. He says, uh, who made you prince and judge over us? And I believe immediately that in that moment, something happened to Moses. He lost confidence in having something to say. He lost confidence in having something to engage people with. Why? Because people will throw back up on you what you did when, you, when you're trying to do better. Oh, can I help somebody up in here? Some people will throw back up in your face who you used to be and what you did and what you thought was buried in a season where you didn't know no better in a season where you were wild in a season where you were tripping but now you're in a better season and you're trying to do better and they'll bring your stuff in front of you and say oh yeah now you want to talk like that you were just drinking with us now you want to talk like that you was looking at pouring her up too. Now you want to talk like that. You were just gossiping over coffee with us. Now you want to talk like that. Oh yeah. You were just acting a fool and doing some of everything like everybody else. But now you want to talk all good. Now you want to act good and good. Now you want to act holy and now. Now you got something to offer. Now you got something to say. Now you got something to talk about. People will take the thing that you in your past and throw it back up in your face when you're trying to do better. Yes, sir. Yes. I believe <laughs> that this caused Moses to lose confidence in having something to say. There's something that happens to you when you feel like people don't respect what you have to say. You end up shying away from confrontation. You shy away from communication. And you feel like they don't respect me. They don't value my voice. They, they don't value my captious opinion or my opinion is captious to them. Well, oh, that's a fancy word. It means unsolicited. <laughs> you probably felt like a nobody to them. And the words used on him by his fellow Hebrew, watch this, who made you a prince and a judge over us, caused him to question who he is. I need you to catch this. Watch this. The Hebrew assailant didn't question the validity of what Moses said. He questioned the validity of the one who said it. <laughs> he didn't question the validity of what Moses said. He questioned the validity of the one who said it. Did I tell you this? Here it is. Some people will only respond to who they think is important. They'll 
They can only respond to who they think has a position of power and authority. And this stems from how we place more value on status than truth. And if we feel like someone is of a certain status, they can say anything and we'll buy into it. Oh yeah, I'll be watching some of y'all posts. Mm -hmm. Some of these folk, y'all be sharing their stuff and posting their stuff and talking about what they talking about and the person ain't saying nothing. Oh my God, ain't no wisdom in what they said and, and you can't find what they said nowhere in the word. You can't find what they said touched nowhere by the Holy Ghost. Y'all just be reposting it and sharing it because they got a million followers. But let somebody come along who's not as powerful. Let somebody come along who ain't got the platform. Let somebody come along who don't nobody know. They can be saying something profound. They can be saying something deep. They can be saying something laced with the grace of the Holy Ghost. And y'all scroll right by it. They ain't saying nothing because they only got a few followers. They only got a few people validating them. They only got a few people saying, oh, that was wonderful. Oh, that was nice. Oh, my God. Your favorite influencer can say, in that minute, mighty more. Catch a tiger by its hole. If they holler, let them go. And y'all repost it like it's the deepest thing you ever seen. But let somebody come along who you don't know. Let somebody come along who you don't believe in. Let somebody come Say nothing. Oh, Lord, have mercy. These people mad. The crazy thing here is some people only respond to who they think is an authority. There's another word you need to look up. It's called titular. T I T U L A R. Titular. And what titular means is that the person has a position, but they don't have no authority. And there's a lot of people who are in position that don't have no authority. And we ignore the people who ain't got the position, but got the authority in their voice. They got the authority on their mind. They wake up in the morning thinking about what God wants. They wake up in the morning believing in what God wants to see done. We don't pay attention to the person been with God, you can pay attention to the person who's got nursery rhymes and tic-tac-toe <laughs> checker moves. Can we unnormalize the exaggerated profundity of simplicity? Oh, that was too much for y'all. Uh, can we unnormalize the exaggerated profundity? Quit exaggerating like it was so deep. That was as simple as I tie my suit. That was as simple as I got out of the bed. That was as simple as I go to bed. Why are we exaggerating simple stuff? But ignore truth. Lace. By the Holy Ghost. I'm going to take my time today. Oh my God. I've been jumping in here like I've been jumping in here all the time. I'm going to take my time. Y'all ain't going to rush me. You can get bored. All you want. Here it is. So Moses left you. And his people. And he felt disrespected and devout. And although he was out of Egypt, when he arrived in Midian, He's in a new place, but afraid to properly introduce himself. Scripture says that he met Jethro's daughters and a well in Midian. He helped defend them against other men. He helped them gather water for their flocks. And when their father saw that they came back so quickly, he inquired and said, how has you gathered all this water and got back so quickly? Watch what the daughter said. An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us, and he watered the flock. 
Jeff Fair City, go get him. He shall eat with us. In other words, why is my school? Why didn't you invite him to the table? Jeff Noah was like, what? Come on, wait a minute. You did what? What happened? He did all of that. Go get him. He shall eat with us. Jeff was like, why y'all didn't invite him to the table? And if I submit to you, here it is. The problem wasn't with the daughters. The problem was with Moses. There are two things we need to get from this. Obviously, they identified Moses as an Egyptian. Because although he wasn't in Egypt anymore, and although he didn't plan to go back, he still looked like the prince he was running from. I need y'all to catch this, ladies and gentlemen. Can I tell you that part of what's keeping you from experiencing your next are the vestiges from your past? Mm -hmm. You still look like your past. You still act like your past. You still walk like your past. You still go along and do the things of your past. Your past is so a, a, a part of your life that when you step into new places, you still look the same. When you step into new places, you still carry yourself the same. You still talk the same. You still walk the same. And part of the reason why you can't get to where you need to be is because you don't understand that when you walk through a new door, you got to look new. When you walk in a new season, you got to act new. When you walk in a new season, you got to talk new. No Moses is still dressed like his old season. And the word of the Lord for you today is if you're going to grasp new opportunity, if you're going to walk through new doors, your old self can't go with you. Your old self can't grasp the opportunity that's in front of you. You're still thinking about what happened to you in the old season. You're still thinking about how they did you in Egypt. You're still thinking about you. You're still thinking about her who joked about you. You're still thinking about her who mocked you. You're still thinking about her who disrespected you. You're still thinking about her who left in the day. And I'm here to tell you that the word of the Lord for you in this next season is change your clothes. I'm going to give you a new wardrobe. I'm going to give you a new hairstyle. I'm going to give you a new way of thinking. I'm going to give you a new way of walking. I'm going to give you a new way of presenting yourself. All you got to do is change your clothes. I don't look at somebody and say, man, you've been wearing that same outfit all for the past five years. God says he's going to give you something new. He's going to put you in some new apparel. He's going to dress you in a new way. He's going to set you up in a new way. He's going to assign you to something new. He's going to give you something new to say. I ain't just going to give you something new to wear. I'm going to give you something new to say. Moses is in a new place, looking like his old season, and that's why they identified him the way they identified him. Which brings me to the second point. Y'all ready for the second point? I said Jermaine. I'm trying to buy me some time to get a drink. Here it is. Moses is so hung up on what happened to him in Egypt that he doesn't recognize what's unfolding before him in his new season. Let's say it again. Moses is so devastated on what happened to him in Egypt that he doesn't recognize what's unfolding in Midian. Moses is so messed up over what happened to him in Egypt that he doesn't recognize what's unfolding at Jethro's house. He felt overlooked. He felt disrespected in his last season. It has caused him to miss his value 
in his loop. Y'all need to catch this. What do I mean by this? The man just cleared out the room at the well. Defending Jethro's daughters. Just did the job of seven people in short of time. Most of you didn't tell me. You never all of that. And you missing out on an opportunity to leverage your influence? Moses, you might have been disrespected in Egypt. You might have been overlooked in Egypt. You might have had people not believe you, but you gained new influence in Midian. Yeah. He didn't even know or recognize the influence that he's gained in Midian. He fails to leverage his influence by asking for a seat at their table. You got to catch this. Can I tell you? This isn't the season to be shy about where you want to sit. I'm going to say it again. This isn't the season to be shy about where you want to sit. Oh, you've got to speak up and say, I bring too much to the table. To not be invited. It was Moses' fault that he wasn't at the table, not the daughter. You didn't recognize the influence you came when you came busting heads and, and clearing out the well and drawing water and doing all the work you did. It was his fault that he wasn't at the table. You got to say, I want my seat, I want my place. And I want my portion. Say that. I want my seat. I want my place. And I want my portion. Say it again. I want my seat. I want my place. And I want my portion. You bring too much to the table to be ashamed to not get a seat. You bring too much to the table to be ashamed and not ask. Hey man, what is it in, in, in this for me? I don't mind doing it, but I ain't going to keep doing it. And you ain't gonna give me a seat. I ain't gonna say that for my seat. I know where I wanna be seated. I know where I wanna sit. I ain't gonna keep showing up, doing everything that I'm doing, and not get a seat. Jethro said, Go get him. What's wrong with y'all? It's full pie not to invite him. Full pie. Means are inappropriate. I'm sorry. Here it is. Jethro invited Moses to the table. He gave him his daughter Sapporah to marry. He gave him a job. And for the first time, we hear Moses speak since the last time he spoke in Egypt. You gotta catch this. We can't see nowhere in the scripture where Moses has said anything since he last left Egypt. We don't see in the scripture where he greeted uh, Jethro's daughters. We don't see him cuss nobody out while he was fighting them shepherds. We don't hear him moan and groan while he was drawing water and feeding and, 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 and watering the sheep. We don't even see him introduce himself to Jethro. I don't know if he did or not, but according to scripture, it's safe to say Moses ain't saying nothing since he ran from Egypt. Jethro brings him in, gives him a seat at his table, gives him his daughter to marry, gives him a job, and the first thing we hear from Moses since he last confronted the Hebrews in Egypt is weird. Moses and Zipporah have a son. And it was tradition for the father to name the son. And Moses names his first son, watch this, not Moses Jr. Then he named him after his daddy. The first thing he names the son is 
excursion, which is translated to stranger. What an awkward name to give your son. Moses is so hung up on Egypt, watch this, that the first good thing that happened in his life since the last season reminds him of something he's missing somewhere else. Moses names his son stranger because he's in a strange land because his mind is still back in Egypt. But I believe, watch this, God used Moses' son as a reminder of unfinished business he has in Egypt. Moses was troubled because in Egypt, sons were in trouble. You have to know a little bit about this, that as Israel began to grow in Egypt, the Pharaoh made a decree that all sons should be exterminated and removed from the land. And the midwives were given the order and the directions to basically uh, abort sons. If a son came out, kill him. If a son came out, destroy him. And what ended up happening is, is that Moses' mother hid Moses. Give him for a season. Until he became too big to hide. And what ended up happening is she created an ark. Now, this is where I'm missing it at because I watch too much TV. I thought that when she created the ark to put Moses in, she set him in the Nile and he floated to Pharaoh's door. But scripture doesn't say that. Watch this. Scripture says she set him in the reeds, meaning she stuck him in a place that she knew Pharaoh's daughter would be to find him. Catch this, ladies and gentlemen. Moses' mother, can I be ghetto? I said, can I be ghetto? Moses' mother let him stop in order so he could be fine. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, here's the question we have to ask ourselves. Sometimes it's not where we're stuck that we need to focus on. It's why we're stuck. Moses was stuck at a place in his life because of the purpose in his life. And it was his purpose, not necessarily Egypt, that he couldn't get off of his mind. It's what he left behind. It's who he left behind. It's why he left him behind that he can't get off of his mind. It's not that he left him behind. It's because he, he left them behind and he missed his purpose. And it's because of his purpose that he can't get Egypt off his mind. And sometimes you can end up stuck until you resolve why you're stuck. However, Moses has a problem. Here it is. And the truth is, you wouldn't even know he had a problem if he didn't point out his problem. See, that's part of our problem. We point out our problem. Moses, the details of his assignment. He told Moses, I've heard my people's cry. I've heard their prayers. I'm going to deliver them, and I'm going to use you. And I can imagine that Moses was happy. I can imagine that Moses was good with that. I can imagine that Moses was going along with the description of God's plan until he heard God say this. Then they will heed your voice. Uh-oh. Now you touched a point in my life, Lord, where they rejected me. You, you touched a point in my life, Lord, where they mocked me. You, you touched a point in my life, Lord, where they disrespected me. I was going along with the plan. If you would just go along with me and say everything that needs to be said. But God is incorporeal, meaning that he don't have a body. He needs a body. He needs people. 
concerned about them. We, we see our deficiencies and we think that God is just concerned about them. Oh my God, we judge ourselves and we think God is judging us and the whole time God is like, don't put your insecurity on me, don't put your deficiency on me, don't put your lack of uh, uh, and confidence and enthusiasm on me. I'll go with you. I'll give you what to say. I'll give you my voice. I'll give you my mouth. Did I stun when I told you I was going to be with you? 
Did I stutter when I told you I was for you and not against you? Did I stutter when I told you I would do it in, in, in short order and in my timing? You've got to understand that if there's a stuttering problem, it's on us. Not God. Here it is, my final points. I got to go. Here it is. Watch this. We always talk about how powerful Moses' rod and staff was. This one I know is Adam Frank. The rod and the staff wasn't even a part of the plan until Moses showed no confidence in his voice. Go study it. Go look at it. God didn't bring up the rod and the staff. On the staff. Moses wanted God to give him something that he could go to into Egypt with. It wasn't even a part of the plan until Moses asked for something extra. You know what I believe? So she said, I believe that God had purpose and plan. To use Moses' voice like he used the wrong. My oh God, y'all missing it. Which means instead of Moses waving the rod over the Red Sea, all he had to do was speak it and it would have divided. Amen, amen. Instead of Moses going in using the rod to match the magicians of Egypt's act, all he had to do was speak it and he would have matched them that he did. He would have defeated them with his voice. But it was because he wanted some extra that God gave him something. And how many times have God made us the primary thing to use but we rely on some secondary purpose us to be the thing he wanted you. And we sit back and we get all crazy. Oh, look at so-and-so go. Oh, look at what they do. No, look at that. And God is like, I wanted to do it in you. But you were too chicken. You were too fearful. You didn't have enough confidence. So I had to use something secondary when you were the primary thing I wanted to use. confrontation with 
The reason God couldn't use Aaron or anybody else that was in captivity is because they would have argued with the plan because, watch this, their deliverance was dependent upon their obedience and their patience to be to suffer a little longer until they get out of the situation. How many times have we argued with God about our situation and about what he's doing on something that we prayed for and now we don't want it because it requires more of us? It would have required them to be patient. I'm going to tell you how I know they wouldn't have been able to be good spokespeople. Because the first time that Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, we get back to work. Now Moses has been out of town for 40 years. 80 years, something like that. He ain't want a job for you in a long time. Who was he talking to? They were talking to Aaron. What you come in my office for? Some of letting some people go, get your behind back out that field and work. That's what Pharaoh told him. He respects Aaron enough for Aaron to be used. He can speak good, but he didn't have the respect. And as soon as Pharaoh corrected them, <laughs> he said, listen, here's what we're going to do. Take all the straw away from them. Take all the mud away from them. And let them build bricks without straw and mud. He increased their labor pains. And you know what happened? This is just the first confrontation. He increased their labor pains. And at the first sign, a Pharaoh hardened his heart. The elders went to Pharaoh. They had the confidence. They had the speaking ability. But they went and argued with the man. They lacked the self-control to be used by God. And can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, there are some of us, we got all of the skills. But we lack the discipline and self-control to do anything and use them effectively. Because we want to argue instead of patiently and cogently presenting our point. I got to go. I'm going out there. I got one more point for you. You know what tripped me out? The whole time, what was Moses' issue? He couldn't speak, right? Watch this. Go study it. Once God was done running Egypt amok and sending plagues and sent that final plague of the firstborn, when Pharaoh's firstborn son was dead because of the plague, Pharaoh summons Moses and Moses and Aaron. And you know what Moses and Aaron had to say when Pharaoh summoned them? What do you think about taking a guess? Once God was done dealing with Pharaoh in Egypt, and he summons Moses and Aaron, you about to take a guess what Moses had to say? Let my people go. What was that? Let my people go. Give y'all one more try. They would let my people go at the beginning. You know what Moses had to say? Not one thing. <laughs> Moses was so concerned about what he would say to Pharaoh. <laughs> Moses was so tripped out about his voice. Moses was so messed up about what he would have to do. But what he didn't understand was that by the time God was done with Pharaoh, Pharaoh did all the talking. And you know what Pharaoh said? Go. Moses didn't have to say anything. Pharaoh was like the rude boys. It's written all over your face. You don't have to say a word. <laughs> God was so good 
done with Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's like, man, just go. Most they have to say nothing. And how many times, I'll leave you with this, have we worried about what we bring to the table when all we got to do is obey God? He'll do the thing for us. And we won't even have to use the thing that we're afraid to use. The thing that we don't have is the thing that God don't need. He just need our obedience. All right. All right. All right. Moses ain't got to say nothing. Moses just showed up on his staff. Pharaoh said, go. Lord. My God. Hallelujah. Lord told me, I can't wait one day. And he told me, I got a feeling everything is going to be all right. You can worry about your future if you want to. You can worry about your purpose and your destiny if you want to. But once God gets ready to do a thing in your life, He's going to be clear about his instructions. And you ain't going to have to worry about him stuttering like you. 